the last session is, is on computation and life sciences, which we actually have started uh, earlier this morning. We have two speakers on uh, the interface of life and, uh, and uh, this interface. And our first speaker is Uri Alon, again in, this, in the theme of interdisciplinarity. He's a physicist by training who is looking at, uh, at biology. Again, he received many awards, including the 2014 Nakasone Award and um, the Jack Solovey Chair in Physics and the Michael Bruno Memorial Award, which is a distinguished award, the important award for young Israeli scientists. Uri, please. I'm kind of just to know the background of the people here. I'm wondering uh, how many people here are computer scientists? That's a vast majority. And others, which are like? They wish they were. Uh, they wish they were. The others wish they were. Like you back there? Linguists? Yeah. Public health. Public health? Yeah. Biology. Biology? Great. Also, uh, yeah. Huh? Medicine, public health. Medicine, public health? Physics. Physics? <laughs> um, so I, I thought, you know, in, in this topic, since some am uh, between physics and, and medicine nowadays, to, to talk about the thing that, that's interesting for me. Uh, and it has to do with, I think, a difference between uh, biology and, and objects like the radio. And here, I'm gonna, at the beginning, I'm going to go through uh, a little analogy for biology that uh, was published by Yuri Lezebnik. It's called, Can a Biologist Fix a Radio? And it's, uh, he talks about this radio and Suppose you know nothing about electronics. You know there's a box that plays music. You want to understand how it works. And this box sometimes breaks and doesn't play. You want to fix it. So in, as an analogy to the way biology used to be, let's say when I shifted to biology around 99 or like 2002, you would secure the funds to buy a lot of radios and then you would shoot them at close range with a metal object and see what you hit to make it stop playing. So you open it up maybe and you see there's lots of colorful objects inside and um, a postdoc would hit um, this, compo this part here and when you hit it the radio stops playing call it serendipitously recovered component, SARC. And this would be a very important part of the story. Right? And then another uh, lab would discover this is connected to a long extensible wire that's absolutely essential. It's the most important component. And it's upstream of this SARC. And, it's, um, and then you'll be this thriving field of MIC and SARC. Another group would discover that this is the really important component, and that this one isn't required, this one is. And later, a group would discover that there's a switch, where sometimes this component is important, sometimes it's not. That's the ultimately most important component. And the field would transform when you find that if one of these components instead of red is black and, and smells burnt, and you replace it, you, the radio works. That's a drug target. And there's a gold rush to find more like that. But it becomes very evident that it's very much more complicated than that. And it works only very rarely. And the way to organize this information is in these diagrams, which is the basis of most biology uh, understandings. So you have some signals that affect MIC, that's up to SARC. And that gives you sound expression. And then there's other signals that's there. Whereas um, if we take the radio as a problem that is already, we know the solution. We'd like to have a description like this, which is universally understandable. It's immediately transformable to a set of differential equations. You can understand every number here as meaning you can uh, fathom that this is designed by kind of repeating circuits that have well-defined functions like modules. 
and figure out, even if it's a very complex uh, thing like this laptop, no person can understand, but you can understand modules of it and be expert. And uh, it's robust, like, uh, like what Tali said. That means if this uh, 33 kilo ohms is now 34, it still works for some tolerance because you can't make resistors perfect. So uh, these circuits are selected among all the circuits that would play music to also play music no matter what this number is within a certain tolerance. That's called robustness. And indeed. Um, Modularity, robustness, reuse of components are the bread and butter of electrical engineering. And um, what transformed, I think, in biology in the last 20 years is the ability to, first of all, measure instead of one by one virtually all the components in the same experiment. That was undreamable 20 years ago. And second, to talk about them in a way that's, that's beginning to resemble diagrams like this. So far away, but... And that's the field, it's called systems biology. The next speaker, Lee Hood, is a pioneer of systems biology. And um, just to give a taste, whereas it used to be uh, let's say a five-year mission to discover one component like MIC like that. Now it's, it's a few days to get graphs like this to describe all the components inside a cell, like proteins, edges, which means X interacts with Y, numbers on the edges, how strongly, and get a, a graph of all the interactions of the cell. So you, have, you can have reasonably complete characterization of many levels of the, what's work going on inside the cell. Looking at this, you can see the tremendous, it's almost hopeless to understand something that is called a, a fuzzball, but there's been advances that are like, like what I said in engineering. For example, if you try to analyze the small scale structure, the subgraphs here, so for example, these are the 13, 13 ways you can connect three nodes, right? 13 connected subgraphs, and ask, is there something special about the way this graph from biology is compa compared to random graphs of the same degree sequence, you find that it is very special and that some subgraphs are hugely overrepresented. And when you look at them, you find that they look like little elementary circuits. And when two components interact, there's even things like logic gates. Or you, and that these circuits can compute, can compute elementary functions, like for example, rejecting a brief pulse of activity because the AND gate needs both. This is a delay. So if you have a delay and an AND gate, you reject brief pulses, but you can respond to per persistent pulses. Or if I change this to an OR, you reject brief off pulses. Or if I change this to a minus sign, you have a, a differential, so it converts a step into a pulse. And these are elementary circuits you can build very complex computations from. And the beautiful thing about them is that they're all feed forward, so you never have unwanted oscillations or, or multi-stability, very robust little elements. And discoveries like these are called net network motifs, and there's just a handful of them that make up large parts of these networks. For example, inside bacteria E. coli, which is a cell that's autonomous, you, know, you give some sugar and salt and it can divide and grow and search for food, etc. There's three kinds of elementary patterns like that, and you can write down this the entire circuit of the thousands of proteins in a way that you can calculate with and reminds you of, of a language like this. It's still far, but there's hope to understand cells like radios. And once you do that, there's also a field called synthetic biology, which means let's build, build little biological computation inside cells so you can have bacteria that make fuels break down pollutants or take out your immune cells and program them to go after specific cancer cells. Or so this, once you have this language, you can design forward. Did I explain myself so far? Any questions at this point? I'm sure there's a question, so maybe i pause, because the majority of you are computer scientists. Let's pause until there's a first question. And we're not going to continue until there's a question. So. Yeah. picture you show yeah. that we can now, uh, now do in a few minutes. 
where is it in this, in this radio, where, where you put it? So ah, this picture? This, this, yes. How does it relate to this picture? Not to, the, to, to what we hope. To what we hope to hope. Okay. So um, those experiments that I talked about, for example, you want to understand all the, so a, cell, a human cell has a DNA that can encode, let's say, a typical cell will have a few thousand kinds of proteins. They're like the resistors, capacitors, and they do things. So you want to have an inventory list of what is inside that cell. So that's, that's called proteomics, and you can, you, know, you want to understand each of those proteins, who it talks to. So that's like cutting up the radio, little pieces, and seeing what pieces are together. That's getting those little edges, um, et cetera. So uh, these different levels of organization have been, thanks to people like Lee, um, turned from laborious manual operations one by one into automated, mach into machines that do it systematically. Is it like this uh, fixed or the movie? Or ah, great. So this is the power of analogy, right? Some, some. So um, it's, it's um, unlike this circuit, there, these proteins are floating in a very dense, uh, maybe goulash, kind of, uh, with some partitions. And they have very sophisticated cues to be localized in certain places. So, so it's a dynamic system, too. Different signals from the outside change the are designed so one protein can become a machine that adds a phosphate to another protein, and that's like a bit of information becomes active, and then it does that to another protein. So you have little circuits like that. And um, so it's working on the chemical space, spatially and temporally. Did I answer your question? Or confuse you, <laughs> give you more information? <laughs> you didn't give all the details. Too much detail? No, no, not Too little. I don't, and I want to talk about what's interesting to me now, and that is, I think it's a difference between radios and biology, and that is the, the, the topic of, of aging. What happens to human beings as we age? How things fall apart? And of course, radios fall apart. Uh, but I think maybe in a different way from people, and I'm actually interested in your take on, on it. Um, I want to tell you how I think about, try to think about aging in the past few years, and um, also to, to get you a sense at the pace that the biological field of aging research is going, which is discovering that <coughs> phenotypes of decline are much more plastic and changeable than was previously believed. Um, Math and Valerie is a PI from aging research and a maintenance PhD student. Um, so when you talk about aging, you discover that there's it's studied in many different. It's still not a very integrated uh, field. There's a lot of study about what changes in your body to cause aging, different kinds of damage, basically. So it's believed that. Body accumulates damage, and and that damage causes the decline. And, and the kind of experiments that are very powerful there is if you if you disrupt the body's ability to repair something like DNA, you get a phenomenon that looks very much like accelerated aging. Did, did I explain myself? So different kinds of damage like that. So it could be repairing DNA, repairing proteins. If you mess with that repair, you get accelerated aging. What, aging, I assume everybody knows what I'm talking about. It's, it's basically, it's, like, it's kind of like a linear decline in different abilities, and also an exponential rise in risks of different diseases. And that, that, when I say exponential rise in risk of diseases, that's the other side. Aging studied from the point of view of patterns. What happens with age? For example, so this is looking what happens with age. And I just want to say that these two levels are, are right now not um, 
there's no way to get from this kind of data to this kind of data, this information. And we want to find it. Yeah, so that's risk of mortality. So this, this uh, yeah, the risk of mortality. For example, this graph, this is the age of the person. And this is the risk of dying in a given year. Okay. So if we look at this graph, and this shape of this graph is quite universal in different cultures, also the different historical periods, except um, the, the fact, okay, so when you were just born, there's, there's, there's a, quite a high risk, and it drops this childhood. This part here is car accidents and suicide. So if we take away those things, we get this exponential rise so that it goes about three orders of magnitude rise between reproductive age and very, very old age as it starts to slow down. This is a universal uh, curve in the sense that it characterizes many different species of mammals and um, in different cultures and times. We're especially the slope, the risk of death doubles every eight years, is um, quite constant. Sometimes different periods of time, you have like, much more child mortality and extrinsic mortality. And that's called Gompert's Law. It was discovered 1830s, I think, or 20s. And um, it's one of those laws of, of aging. And the other kind of law of aging is if I pull out here the risk of getting age-related diseases like um, cancer, diabetes, and uh, dementia, and osteoarthritis, and all this. They also, if you, they also have exponential rise. And the slope is really similar. It's like almost doubling every seven, eight years for most of those diseases. So that makes you think maybe if you come from physics and you believe in simplicity or the hope, of, maybe there's a common process or time scale inside the body because so these very different diseases have a similar slope. And, and another thing about aging is that the variation in the condition of different individuals opens up with age. So you can imagine healthy 20 or 30 year olds, more similar in things you can measure, like um, just how quick it takes you to get up from a chair or how much glucose you have, than uh, 80 year olds where you can, or 70 year olds, you can think a 70 year old could look like a 50 year old or like a 90 year old, right? It's like, we know that from, it's, that happens almost every trade you can measure, an opening up. So there's some stochastic process, you can say, we can believe, that has, maybe, that has a, sets this uh, pace of aging and it opens up between individuals. Okay, where does this variability come from? Oh yeah, there's a question. So I'm opening this up. I'd love to have questions, yeah. So I, Yeah, this jump. Okay, this, this jump is primarily extrinsic mortality, so people get into trouble. Car crashes, suicides. More men than women. So it has nothing to do with, with that? But, but I think it has very much to do with puberty because of... Um, yeah, hormones are the... So there's the why and the how, right? The hormones are the how puberty happens. There's the why. And why in the biology is always connected with the theory of evolution. And the question of the evolution of aging, puberty, childhood, etc., is fascinating and, and is reached a synthesis, which I find uh, I'd like to tell you because I think it's relevant. Um, why is there aging? <clears throat> so the theory is that it's called the disposable soma. If you can make a change to the system that increases, that makes you better at reproducing, but that same change comes at the expense of your function after reproduction, that will be selected because what natural selection does is move genes to the next generation. And so that the, the tuning of the system is to have good repair through the reproductive years 
and that's the amount of repair you have. But then, I'll, as I'll show you, if processes are running and you have a finite amount of repair, those accumulating processes at some point will overcome repair, and then you have a, a, pro, you have a process you weren't designed for. So um, in human beings' reproductive age, there's menopause, and then there's some people think additional fitness for the grandfather, grandmother effects, where you care for your genes, but they're not inside your, you, they're inside other people, your relatives. And what sets the lifespan of creatures, according to this theory, and it's quite well supported, is what's called extrinsic mortality. So if you're a mouse, and after a year you're going to be eaten, that sets the amount of repair you have. And the mouse in the lab under, lived for two years or so, two and a half years. If you have a car and you know that it's going to be stolen in three months, you don't do pull a cell telephone like, to try to fix it, right? So that's, that's the kind of reasoning. It's a little bit mathematized, too. And uh, other ways of thinking are that aging is a programmed process and that all these things are um, transitions that are programmed. And I, I, I'm less inclined to think that. But um, so it's a kind of an early days. So the field is quite open. Did I explain myself so far? Um, OK, so I'd like to think about what could be this shared timer. I should say that it could be that people age differently because we're born with different genes. So that, of course, that affects what disease you get. Sometimes you get cancer, sometimes you get diabetes. But it doesn't appear to change to affect your longevity very much. It's maybe 20%. Heritable. So it's, it's not primarily your genes. And, and the way I like to think about it is that I want to add something additional to the thinking, is that when you think about uh, organisms like human beings, our cells in our body, mo in most of our organs, are continuously being made and, and destroyed. So for instance, in the skin, um, cells are replaced every 30 days. There's stem cells, which are permanent cells. They stay there. They make the skin cells, and the skin cells are then shed off. What stays in the body are those stem cells. Same thing with blood. You have stem cells in your bone marrow. You make red blood cells. They live about 100 days. So the body is kind of disposable. It has a 100-day turnover time, most tissues like that. What stays in the body? are those stem cells that are, have the ability, to, they're basically immortal, and they can divide. Itself. So when I think about what can be different about the decade of 20 to 30 and 70 to 80, it's not something so important about those disposable skin cells or the cells that have a 100-day lifetime. That can't be it. It has to be something that's accumulated in cells that last for a lifetime. So it has to be accumulated in those stem cells, the ones that are continue. There's something in there that makes makes that decade. So your, your knees are getting the same amount of wear and tear when you're 20 and when you're 70, maybe. But why do you get this osteoarthritis when you're 70, not when you're 20? So tell me about the stem cell. And what is it is that, so we know they stick around. We know that they divide. And we know in, from biology that when cells divide, there's errors in the DNA. You get about three changes of a letter somewhere in your three billion letters every time the cell divides. So inside your body, those cells, every time they divide, have more and more errors. And that is a process that rises linearly with time. Your stem cells have more and more errors because they're division. when you're adult, you're dividing all the time. So that's a linear process. And those cells now make defective skin cells, the mutant ones, the defective liver cells, defective intestinal cells. So here and there, you have mutant stem cells, and they make a little column of defective skin cells. Here, 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 here. That's great. And that rises linearly with time. That's not enough to give you this exponential process. Let's see. But there's something biologists have discovered in the last decade that I think is a good uh, prox or good, could be a, a central point to explain this kind of timer. And that is the damaged cells do something <laughs> that, uh, that's as follows. A damaged cell, so the skin cell, can do uh, one of two things. 
it can kill itself in order to avoid becoming a cancer cell. Or what it does more and more often is and stop dividing and become what's called a senescent cell, which is a damaged cell that keeps, keeps doing what it's supposed to, but it's guaranteed never to divide and not to turn into a cancer cell. And those senescent cells are very good for you. They're, they're part of this uh, program that I said is good for you when you're young. When you're young and you get injured, so you have some injury here. If all the cells, damaged cells kill themselves, I would have a hole here. That's very bad. Instead, what uh, cells do is become senescent. They stop dividing. They can't turn into cancer cells, but they keep, they keep the tissue intact. And then they call in the immune system to remove them, like those macrophages we talked about, to remove them slowly. They stop cells from near them for, to, from dividing till they're removed. And they're very, very good for wound repair. But when you get old, as I said, because of those mutations all over your body, it's like your entire body becomes more and more filled with wounds, linearly increasing with time. Like that. And then the senescent cells accumulate, and when they accumulate, they cause, they call in the immune system. Another way to say that is inflammation. Your body fills with inflammation. That's called inflammaging, which is a very uh, well-known cause of many diseases. They stop regeneration and offer a very powerful link between damage and what we think about aging. Inflam inflamed body, slowly regenerating. And the senescent cells accumulate very strongly with age and different tissues. And here's the amazing experiment that galvanizes the field. When you remove the senescent cells from mice, you get... Um, a kind of reversal of many aging um, processes. So this is a, two mice. You can see them. They're twins. They're identical twins. They're, they're born in the same litter. Now they're two years old, which is like a 70-year-old person for mice. This is a typical, this is what a typical mouse looks like when they're two years old. They have um, less hair and cataracts, and they're hardly running on the wheel. They have more and more cancer, etc., just like people. And in this mouse, uh, using a, this is not a pill or something, this is like a, a genetic trick that um, turns on a death gene inside cells that are, that are senescent, so it kills senescent cells, starting from middle age. And these mice are very active, and they have delayed onset of a whole range of age-related diseases, and they live longer, too. And, and th since this finding, that was published in 2000... Is there a sign please? Yeah, so not, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not trying to... Uh, let's just say, th this, um, this, of course, got a lot, a lot of attention. For people interested in basic research, it, it's, an, it's another um, signature of the, of the plasticity of the rates, the rates of aging. Right? So uh, you can make animals age faster, and there's certain ways you can make them age slower. One way is um, lowering down the metabolism, and I think that also affects the rate which mutant cells become senescent because there's less damage in them. So there's, there's several ways now to do that uh, in mice. And um, so I wanted to show you this because I hope in a conference like this, maybe there's some people looking for ideas and interesting problems to choose. This is very, very new. So this was, this was 2016. So since then, there's been um, dozens of groups publishing on on different diseases like Alzheimer model, mouse models and osteoarthritis, that removing senescent cells specifically reduces chances or helps with different kinds of diseases. And understanding how that works is a, is a, is a big part of biology research. And there's a lot to understand about what these senescent cells are because it's difficult to study them. And, and so I just wanted you guys to know about this part of biology, which is. Um, currently expanding and full of unknowns. Um, 
what I want to say is that, yeah, yeah. I can hear you, and I'll repeat the question. So, so there's the, la the less of uh, rate, the lo lower rate of splitting, and also that there's accumulation of these bad guys. Yeah. Whatever you call them senescent. Senescent cells. Okay. Yeah. So, so is it that uh, if you increase the rate of, is it a question of a fraction or or, or an absolute number? So Good. in other words, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Is it the question you're asking? Is the negative effect on on health a, fa a function of let's say total number of senescent cells in the body? or a fraction of senescent cells versus two. Right. Yeah. Um, so those kind of questions are now a topic of research. Um, I can say that um, if you look at individual mice and you make them emit photons in proportion to how many senescent cells they have by different tricks, you can see that <coughs> they have these stochastic trajectories. So this is time, and this is number of senescent cells that open up with age. So at age, some mice have a lot, some have as little as young, as few as young mice. And it's clear that if you add senescent cells, the risk of death increases. And if you remove senescent cells, risk of death and diseases decreases. So it looks like it could be that total body senescent cells is the thing because they work by secreting into your blood all kind of inflammation factors and locally stopping regeneration. But we just don't know exactly, yeah. So, so the other question is, is it reasonable sort of as computer scientists and thinking, do these cells talk? I mean, when you do this research, yeah. do you talk about them individually? Are they talking to each other? Yeah. Are they counting? How yeah. Are they talking? So a good question, and that's open. So even maybe what you're asking, as a computer scientist, can I think of it as a kind of a distributed algorithm and maybe figure out uh, some properties of the of the system that could help us account for the observations about aging. So they talk to each other both locally. There's called bystander effect. They can make cells near them become senescent, and globally through secreting factors that go through the blood and talk to all the cells. So there's a potential for that. And did I answer your question or not? That's what. They do, yeah. But, but, so if they're far away from each other, they talk less? Is that, I mean, they, or, the, or the degree of the strength of the signal would be... Would decrease, decrease, yeah. And, yeah, this is, a, in biology, we think of um, secreted factors that go through the circulation, and all cells see them more or less equally. And then paracrine signaling, which means talking to neighbors, which would decrease with, with distance. And the even contact-based signaling. So there's three kinds, which are all... Um, Relevant. Anyway, if you have data like this, stochastic signal like this, you can ask what stochastic process might generate this. So we did that. And um, we looked, we basically scanned a lot of differential equations that are production, removal, and noise, a lot of the kind of differential equations. And we came up with a minimal one that we like because it explains a lot with a little. The rate of change of senescent cells increases linearly with time, like I said before, with age, linearly with age. And then we think from our lot of data that they slow down their own removal. This has to do with your question, but it's enough to say a global. I'm not saying there's no local, but definitely a global is enough. So the removal, usually when you think of removal, this is rate of removal per senescent cell, and it decreases with the number of senescent cells. Okay. And then there's a stochastic process we'd love to know more about. I think that it should do something with behavioral stress, cortisol, et cetera. This removal is the immune system. So what this is saying is that you're given enough immune system to remove those senescent cells when you're young. When you're old, there's so much of these mutations that look like injuries that those cells become very busy and can't do the work enough. And, you're, and that causes, in fact, a more than a linear, an amplification of the amount of senescent cells. And causes a problem because your immune system is supposed to do other things too, like work on cancer infections. So we think that saturation is very important and it gives, as I said, a very steep rise in the number of senescent cells. It makes, if a person, according to this uh, 
point of view, is unlucky and has too much senescent cells, that re reduces the rate of removal, and then that person has more. And so at old ages, the stochastic process becomes that if you have more than average, you stay like that for years. If you're less than average, you stay like that for years. So it automatically opens up this kind of persistence difference between organisms. And we could estimate the lifetime of those senescent cells. So oh, this is fast and, and persistent. When you're old, it's persistent variation. We could experimentally verify in mice that indeed these senescent cells quickly are removed when you're young, five days, and very slow when you're old, 30 days. Um, and finally, we could ask, how could this stochastic process explain that exponential rise risk of death that, that we discussed? And to do that, you have to make some more assumptions or at least focus research on questions like Shafi asked, when do you die? So, for instance, if senescent cells cross a threshold, let's assume, this person would die here, this person would die there. And then it's a first crossing time problem to see the distribution of probabilities of death. And you can compute that for that process, and you get analytically this exponential increase with a slowdown. You, can, you have to add the external death here at young ages in order to get it. And that got us excited because we can now compute based on basic parameters what that doubling every eight years is and how you can manipulate it. That's one uh, way to think about it. And then uh, this question of diseases, why do different diseases, so these are, this is age and this is risk of getting different diseases, also rises exponentially. If, again, these diseases are a threshold crossing problem, you automatically get this exponential, and the, the thing about each disease is it has its own threshold, and that's determined by your genetics and whether you smoke or not. And that can explain that's this exponential rise in different diseases. It also has really unexpected predictions. Like if, if you have two, if, you have, if there's a single timer, and each disease has a threshold, then if you get two diseases, you're guaranteed that the one with the lower threshold will happen before the one with the higher threshold, because it's a single process. And that makes cr crazy predictions about order of diseases. And in order to test that, we, as you heard before, there's these amazing resources of complete medical records, like Kupat Kholim Klalit, which we can look at at Weizmann. And you indeed see these predicted temporal orders of diseases for people that have both. <laughs> I was really amazed by that. So you can... Uh, so, so what amazing <laughs> For example, suppose you have a... A population that has two, two diseases. A person with two diseases. You ask when they got those diseases. So um, according to this probability of getting these diseases, you have a null model that they occur. This one occurs. This, 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 this is a probability like that. But if there's a single clock that needs to cross two thresholds, it'll always cross the long, lowest threshold first. So there will be a more than, av a, a, a more than predicted order. More than implied by but independence. And sometimes uh, you can say maybe that's a, there's a causation, medical causation. But sometimes you can have diseases that occur less often together than at random. So there's no medical causation. And you, you find these temporal orders. Like you get this disease before you get this disease. And that's for me another evidence that there's um, How many diseases uh, have you seen again? Uh, we have a, a thousand, order of a thousand ICD-9 codes that are age dependent. And, and they, they, uh, they have these exponential rises, most of them. There are some exceptions, like menopause can, in women can affect osteoporosis. Dementia is a little bit different, it's more, but widely it's, a, it's the general rule. About half of them. So different colors or different diseases. Yeah, yeah, different colors, different diseases. This is just a uh, sampling. This is, this, is, this is hypertension, for example, and this is uh, diabetes, and then you can look at different subgroups of them. So, okay, what I, I would just not to go into too many details and maybe stop also ahead of time so we can have more of a discussion. And uh, I wanted to propose that. Um, 
in biology, the take, taking uh, ideas from engineering uh, was revolu really revolutionized, I think, the ability to look, to understand cells and to think of designing new biology that might have been, could have been. And that's thriving. Um, and of course, a lot more to do. Uh, and I want to ask whether the question of, of aging, the way the, the body declines, um, I think there's, there's hope that, uh, that this problem is, is less uh, complex than it, it might seem at first, or like uh, hopeless to think about from a quantitative perspective, and to maybe ask you, you guys here with all your different expertise, what this resonates in you and whether you have any, um, any ideas that could, could be um, interesting for me. <laughs> so I'll stop here and wait for your questions. I want to make sure that I understand the source um, so you're talking about the accumulation of nascent cells, um, but you started by describing a phenomenon with the stem cells. Yeah. And if I understood correctly, and this is what I'm trying to verify, it's the stem cells themselves who are generating more and more corrupt cells right. who then become nascent. Yeah. I, th you, I agree. Yeah, that's Why not then attack the stem cells? Good. So um, now we're asking... Uh, the question is about <coughs> strategies to address uh, age-related diseases, right? So one strategy is to remove senescent cells. That's one possibility, and there's some, some progress in finding drugs that, that do that. And that's beginning. But the stem cells are going to be generating more. The stem more cells than... are going to continue producing senescent cells. So you need to, if you do that, you need to give it a certain frequency and based on models like this, we know what frequency is, basically the lifetime of senescent cells. Can you now uh, remove those stem cells that are making the senescent cells? Okay. That um, could be, but it would require kind of science fiction abilities right now because those stem cells themselves don't know that they're mutated. It's mutations that don't bother with the stem cells. They only are a problem when they become the skin cell, let's say, or the liver cell because that gene is silent in the stem cells and turns on. And so if you want to find out among the stem cells who the mutant is, and, and that's, that's maybe those bots we heard we about. Know the mutations are. So those mutations, by the way, are random, so they can occur, and they do occur almost anywhere. And so the kinds of damage are, are very stochastic. So each, each little patch of skin is unhappy in its own way. <laughs> <laughs> but there are also general things you can do, which is once you are a damaged cell, a mutated cell, in order for that to turn into damage to your hardware, that mutation needs to do things which are chemical, like reactive oxygen species. So if you th do things like slow down the metabolism of the cell, that also helps because they're damaged, but they don't become senescent. So those are another point of intervention. It, it just and then like the third one, I just want to say... So the stem cells themselves are corrupt. Of course, they, they have the one copy of the DNA that they're yeah. using. Of course, they can't do it. But if you're, I mean, this is classical engineering, right? So bring some redundancy in and... Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, there's, I there's things to do there. Yeah. And then you yeah. attack the source of the problem yeah. rather than the symptom. Got it. Yeah, you, if you can design humans 2.0 that have redundancy... I'm not, I mean... I know lots of humans who have redundancy. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I, I, I would just say another uh, approach is to strengthen the immune system. That, uh, that's also another approach to... But Doesn't it, it also become senescent also? Yeah, it, it also becomes senescent. So parts of it go down, parts of it go up with age. If you, if you could simply tell us that you are 160 years old, this would be very helpful. Yeah. I also want to say that in this field, it's, it's not lifespan extension that's thought to be feasible. It's more... Um, it, living and dying like that with a very short disease span. So I want to clarify that it's, 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 uh, it's almost impossible to extend lifespan very much in mice, maybe 25% or something like that. 
even though mice and bats, which are so similar, mice live two years and bats live 50 years. So evolution found out a way to do that, but it's not possible. We, can't, we don't know why we can't do that and don't have, but we can't. But, and, and even if we could, it would take decades to find out in human beings. But the prospect of addressing age-related diseases is much more, uh, is, is what, what we're after. So I want to say that it's confusing sometimes. It's not living, living to 160 we think is, is beyond what we can imagine, but healthy living till 90 or something like that is, is more. You're essentially talking about the stem cells and cells to the rest of the body, but what about north of the stem cell to the brain? Uh, um, that, the brain. That, that mouse that's uh, two years old yeah. by mouse age, that's like a 70-year-old human. Yeah. Now you take, let's say, a one month that, that mouse may look like a one-month-old mouse by mouse age, but what, what's going on in that mouse brain? Um, has anything improved in terms of the, uh, the, the mouse being a complete mouse as it was when it was one month old, in terms of being active and yeah. being able to be capable as it was? That, isn't that the problem with uh, applying that principle to human health of of uh, taking senescent cells out of the body and making the person young again. What about the brain? Yeah, so the very good question. Um, and we know that the part of worst aspects of aging is where you lose parts of your personality, memory. Yeah. Um, so that's also an active area of research. It's, it's quite clear that a part of dementia has to do with inability of the brain to clear damage from neurons. Part of that is done by immune system. And it's also known from those mouse models of dementia, which aren't very excellent models of humans, is that removing senescent cells from the body improves the ability of the brain to deal with damage and plaques. And I think that one of the reasons is that you desaturate the immune system from so the immune system has many tasks. Among them, clearing senescent cells. But if that becomes the overriding task, because your body has, uh, I'd say like this, 300 grams of macrophages and 300 grams of senescent cells, then the ability of those macrophages to deal with removing damage becomes compromised. So I think that's one way to think about it. And, um, and the brain does very well for decades. Not, I mean, declines. So it's so between 20 and 30 is 10 years. Between 70 and 80 is also 10 years. But those 10 years are so different. So I think it's something about the maintenance. That's my one way to think of it. Did I? Okay. Jackie, any last I, question? Uh, sure. I wanted to ask a question. So um, the reason I was asking about a distributed system is because of some work. And, and what we discovered where the idea is to try to model um, to have a system where you, get, you can't count how you're trying to figure out how you start with N cells, say, and make sure that even though they split and die, that they don't go underneath N over two, say, and then don't go above two N, okay? Great. And you want to get to this uh, by exchanging messages. And there's a way to do, do this. But what we found was important in our modeling, it's an abstract problem, is that there is some sort of clock. So uh, they do something within a time step and then they do something else. So there's a whole program to follow step by step and then they follow it again and again and again. And throughout the lifetime they can maintain this invariant of being not too few and not too many. So is there some um, clock. clock that wor yeah. goes into this? So first of all, I want to talk with you because that's a very, very biologically relevant question. There is a, 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 one major clock is of course the 24 hour clock circadian. When we sleep a lot of repair happens. Because the body divides labor, wake, sleep. Repair in the brain, repair in the body. And if you s disrupt sleep a little bit even, for instead of eight hours, six hours, there's um, many, many um, adverse effects on memory, brain. So there's, there's a reason to think well, why a clock like that, of be active, repair, be active, repair, is, is central somehow. We don't understand exactly. So maybe that's one. That, I don't know if that's the right time scale. So it's basically the time scale also of one division. So, so they know that there is a, a phase, and then there's another yeah, phase. Yeah, that, that's very, seems to be very important in some, some way to this problem. So maybe you can help us shed light on that. We have to move on. Thanks. I thank you again.